it all myself, <laughs> but I forgot the chocolate as well. And <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Maybe it's down downstairs. Today's topic is uh, visual object recognition. You got basically the basics from the uh, showers. I just want to have a sort of intro to uh, present the, the problem. And of course, the problem in two, really in two sentences, is of course you see this image. What you've heard from shower is that you extract some features from the, of, of the image. You may do a sort of contour extraction at the level of V1, and you get that uh, sort of image. You may also uh, extract the colors here, and you get some more information. But of course, you have to understand what you see here, okay? And that is the problem of visual object recognition. That, of course, cannot be done uh, uh, by the eye. It can only be done, it, it, it's not enough for the lens to project the image on the retina, but you have to decipher it, and therefore, yeah, the uh, problem has to be resolved at the level of the brain. And that's just an example for you. Anyone seen this example? You've seen it, but you've seen it now. Okay, so here we go. And basically, just to give you some idea about the physiology, because we are interested in the physiology here, and the general uh, aspect that we're going to talk about here in, the, in this lecture is sort of the connection between and some theoretical ideas about how to uh, decipher the picture that you see. It tells something about the physiology. It tells you about you know the uh, different uh, visual uh, areas and uh, the time of arrival of the wave is shown here. So it goes from 40 milliseconds at uh, v uh, LGN, 60 milliseconds V1, and so forth, so on and so forth. So you get first of all the hierarchy here, and uh, we're we're focusing on the ventral stream. As uh, uh, mentioned, and basically the one that the point I want to mention here is okay. As you go in the ventral stream, you see that first of all complexity of the visual stimulus becomes bigger. Okay, so this is something that the physiologists have known for like uh, 20 or 30 uh, years now. Okay, the complexity of the visual stimuli become become bigger, so that if in V1 you found that there were uh, edge detectors. If you move on, you find that in uh, infratemporal cortex, you suddenly have uh, face uh, cells. And, okay, you have base cells. I don't think so, but you have, <laughs> but you have uh, cells which are responsive to more and more sophisticated categories. So that, and the question is, okay, you get that. How do you take that information and can now uh, construct what the visual image is, okay? So, one idea is made that you may have sparse coding. You may have face cells, flower cells, base cells, and so on, balloon cells, and so on and so forth. We don't think so, right? So you'll hear about a different approach in the first talk, which is sort of. Wait, uh, what do you think so? I think that we have different results. Yes, yeah, no, no, so you will hear about it. I, and if, I, if I'm really something, you stop me now, okay? No. Yes, okay? So this is sort of the first controversial, controversial issue that we want to discuss. I mean, this theoretical issue we want to discuss. And just to give an idea, if you look at these uh, cells at the uh, level of uh, V4 to IT, so this is mid-level vision, V4 and IT is infratemporal cortex, that's what's called high-level vision. If you look at the response of the neuron, so here's just one neuron, and you see, and this is just a sort of a PSPH, you see it starts to respond in about 100 milliseconds, and, uh, and you see its response to a chair, okay? And here's the response to a chair, Here's the response to an umbrella. That's the second stimulus here. <coughs> that you rank the order of the stimuli according to the firing rate of the cells. So you see, it responds to a chill, but it also responds to an umbrella. And I don't know what this is, a meat grinder, okay? So that, that just shows you that, uh, okay, it doesn't respond to elephants in cars, okay? So that gives you some idea about uh, uh, the, the, the problem, okay? And the rest you'll hear from the students. So please. Uh, you're the first.
additional question, let's keep it to the discussion unless it's something very urgent. Uh, so uh, we are going to talk today about uh, the ventral temporal cortex and specifically the IT. It's also called the IT and the VPC. We'll use the word IT now. Uh, and uh, its role in categorization, specifically in visual categorization. So uh, what visual categorization is and why it's so interesting, in my opinion, what makes it so interesting is the fact that you haven't been exposed, most of you, to these photos here. And although that you haven't been exposed to these photos here, you have no problem classifying them. So you, do, you don't know this specific animal, but you know that this is a snake and those are all snakes. As much as you know that those are all students from our college, though that you don't know them in this specific situation. And this is what I think is so interesting in visual categorization. So Woody has already discussed about uh, the eventual uh, pathway, and we are specifically talking about the left, so the highest level in the hierarchy. Uh, the IT is here in the temporal lobe, and this is the highest level of the hierarchy in the uh, ventral pathway. This is the area which we are talking about now. And there is a question about what are the goals, the computational goals in, uh, of IT, uh, in terms of the visual categorization. So uh, in uh, our review, uh, they determined three important uh, uh, goals, generalization over exemplars, separability between uh, categories and flexibility, and we'll talk about <coughs> each and every one of them now. So what generalization is? In generalization, when I'm talking about generalization, I mean maintain higher response to image in the same category regardless to basic features. So for example, you can see this photo. Is there any laser here? Yeah. You can see these photos here. If we talk about basic uh, features, each and every one of them is very different from another. We have different contrasts. We have different orientations. Even here we have a painting or this is a statue. However, we can see easily that these are all faces. So this is a very, very good ability of generalize over low level feature in order to see and uh, to categorize something in a higher level. Here is another uh, example, a bit different. Here we see the same exemplar in different orientation. And we'll, although we see it in different orientation, it's pretty easy to see that these are all the same person. I don't know who it is. Uh, but uh, this is a very nice uh, uh, example. And we see the generalization is a way to create categories, but we also need the other uh, issue, which is not only creating categories, but also separate between two categories. And how it's done, and this is the opposite way to, uh, um, and this uh, attitude is the opposite way to Grand Marcel, which uh, Udi just mentioned, and they said it's done through vector representation and linear classifiers. What do I mean? I mean, that if, for example, I have this blue, Blue, in blue here we have faces and in green we have houses. I have uh, those that present those stimuli and every stimulus that I present, I, uh, I have a, a look at the uh, activity uh, in the uh, IT, in the ventral temporal cortex, and I want to see what every neuron responded to. I don't want to see a specific neuron, but the response of the whole population. Mm -hmm. So I have here, for example, the whole population, and you see that every neuron respond differently to different stimuli. So now, if I have a, this a responses to different stimuli, I can create a vector response of every stimulus, and then see, uh, and then uh, try to compare between those vector responses. So for example, here I compare between neuron number one and neuron number n. It's very, very, very abstracted, and usually it's not 2D and it's more dimensional. Uh, but you can see that here we can put a very, very rough boundary between uh, faces and places. For example, this is only an example, and this is an important thing. We'll come back to it later. I just want to make sure that you understood what I was talking about. So is it understood? Great. And the third thing is flexibility, <coughs> uh, the ability to extract category information at multiple levels of abstractions, so if, for example, I have these two exemplars here, I can categorize those exemplars in different uh, levels. So I can think about something very general, such as animate uh, versus inanimate, or to uh, think about uh, uh, categories that are a bit more specific, as we can see here. And if 
I can categorize this in so much levels, so many levels, I need to gain access to each and every level of such debt. Uh, unfortunately, I won't talk about flexibility today, but Carmel will mention it a little bit, or not? No. Not really, a little bit, <laughs> maybe, okay. So let's dive a little bit into some data. Uh, so uh, our experiment is done on monkeys, <laughs> and it's a very nice one. And thi in this experiment, the monkey sat and in front of him uh, were presented a couple of pictures. Uh, you can oh. see that. I'm going to talk, okay, so um, I'll, I'll summarize it before I'm, I'm continuing. So first, here, what I showed is a rough overview, uh, uh, which reviews the try to say what were the goals of the IT in visual categorization. And those are just the goals. Those are, this is a computational uh, thinking. It's not experimental. What I'm going to, sh to show now is an experiment that try to show if or how uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, features of the uh, IT helps him to categorize, uh, uh, looking to these uh, goals that we thought about, separability, generalization, and flexibility. Uh, the, paper, uh, the paper title is helpful to understand. Just recap what that means. So selectivity and tolerance, invariance between increased visual information progress from cortical areas before and IT. Uh, okay, so a moment about the task that we did. So they presented uh, the monkey with a couple of uh, uh, pictures from different times. So natural pictures like this one and scrambled pictures that we'll discuss in a moment about what is this scrambled picture is. And the monkey was uh, uh, presented with this picture and he had this half quote uh, that when this motorcycle was shown, uh, he had to saccade his eyes and then he got, uh, he got a reward. Uh, this test was uh, nothing to do, had nothing to do with, uh, with the experience. It was only to keep the attention of the monkey. We were interested, or the investigator were interested in what happens in the brain during this phase when, uh, when the uh, natural and scrambled uh, photos were presented. So they made single cell recording from IT and also from D4, which is a lower area in the hierarchy uh, in, uh, in the ventral textbook, in the ventral, in the ventral uh, spectrum. Yep. Uh, what do you mean by random picture? Yeah, they, pick, they, they chose some pictures, they chose, uh, they had a bank of pictures. And these scrambled pictures are actually the same pictures like here, but we'll talk about it right now, what the scrambled pictures are. Uh, so they took the regular pictures, the natural pictures that they, uh, that they presented and uh, scrambled it. Uh, and the way that they scrambled it is a way such that it's keeping the same low level element. What do I mean? I mean that if it's keeping the same statistics of the low level <coughs> element, the response uh, to the the <laughs> picture and the natural picture if of D1 should be the same because this, uh, uh, these two uh, uh, pictures have the same low level element. So the neurons in D1 see the same see the same thing or are sensitive to the same thing in both in this picture and this picture. So they have the same uh, low level feature but they of course are very different in the high level uh, in the high level uh, element. So what did they do? And this is a, a, another important slide. So they presented this picture, both the scramble and the natural. So, and for example, they presented this blue picture here a couple of times. They didn't present it just once, they presented it a couple of times. And as we said, they got a vector response for every time they presented. So they picked a, a neurons from both areas and they wanted to see the responses of the neurons and they got a vector response for each and every picture. However, uh, if I present the same picture a couple of times, uh, I, I won't get exactly the same response. I will get there will be some changes in the responses. So you can see that we have a couple of blue points over here representing the couple of uh, uh, vector responses. 
response that we got. But th what they try to do is they try to classify after presenting this photo, for example, a couple of times, try to put a linear classifier that will uh, make the classification of this photo uh, uh, compared to all the other photos. So if I have a, a, a vector response that is inside the uh, linear classification, and I have it not only on two neurons, it, this, those arrows are meant to, to show that those are on many neurons. This graph is supposed to be n-dimensional. This is only an example. Uh, but if I have a, a vector response that uh, this point will be inside the linear classification, I can say that it's part of it. So what they did, they put and uh, they showed the same picture x time, for example. They created the linear classification and now they tested it. They showed the same picture once again and they wanted to see if uh, the classifier classified it correctly or not. So if it's inside or outside of the uh, linear, of the linear classifier. Uh, is it clear? If this is clear, we are very good. Yes. No, it's, yes, yes, they, they, got, they did, they presented the same on here like this, they presented it to two Yes. Maybe the better, but uh, what about the, the low feature, the, the low level feature, the, the high level feature? Low level features, low level. Sorry? So low level features are, like we discussed with Shaul, are things like orientation, like the, uh, the location on the retina, uh, the scale and the, the about this graph. If not, we'll continue and see what's going on. Yes. Okay, we'll continue and we'll, we'll see it in a moment. Yes. Is there a difference? Do they check the difference between correct child and incorrect child? What do you mean? There was a behavioral test, right? They didn't just have to ah. watch the pictures? Uh, okay. But they didn't, it wasn't any part of the behavioral test. So this was, those pictures were the pictures that were presented before the behavioral ah. test. So this is not the motorcycle. He, the monkey only had to uh, react to the motorcycle. Okay, so what they test was the ability to separate. So they showed this picture, the uh, uh, scrambled and the natural picture, both to DT, and they, test the, they tested, they tried to put this linear classifier both in V4 and in IT, and wanted to see the response, or wanted to see the success rate of the uh, classification. And what they expected to see is this thing. They, they thought that in low level areas, uh, the area and uh, the performance in natural and uh, scrambled uh, and scrambled picture will be the same. So the, since natural and scrambled picture both have same or very, very uh, similar low level features, we'll see a very, very uh, uh, sh uh, similar uh, performance uh, in classification both in the natural and the However, when we move to the high level areas, in high level areas we have a huge difference between the uh, high level elements in, a natu in the natural uh, uh, photos and those that are lack in the scrambled photos. This is why they expect that high level areas will show a very, very they will have deficit in a, a classification of scrambled uh, pictures. And this is exactly what happened. So first, you can see in this graph, uh, for your question, David, this is the number of neurons that are used uh, in the vector <coughs> uh, classification. So I can use uh, a short number of neurons or a lot of neurons. And they didn't use more than 150. And uh, this is the percent correct. So first, we see in the graph, the red graph is the scramble, the uh, black graph is the natural. So first, we see that as more neurons we take, we have 
more data and uh, a vector, uh, the vector representation is larger and it's easier to uh, classify. However, it is, you can see that indeed high key shows lar a larger deficit to encode the scrambled uh, uh, stimuli. You can see it both here and here we, when we talk specific about 140 neurons, you can see that uh, there is a huge difference in the uh, performance of A of high key. And why is it so? We can say that probably this is because that uh, IP is not sensitive to low level uh, features and V4 is a bit more sensitive to it. Therefore, uh, when we talk about, um, um, about <coughs> a, a classification that is based only on low level features, we have a problem doing it. IP has much more problem doing it. And so we discussed about separability. Another interesting thing to do would be to do it in generalization. What does that mean? So the same thing, the same method was you think you can think about this black square as the stimuli, like this lovely giraffe here, and this weird thing, I have no idea what it is. And they presented this couple of times, uh, and they created this, the uh, classification, right? And afterwards, what they did in order to test is not presenting the same, uh, is not presenting the same uh, picture, <coughs> but to present the picture with some change. For example, changing the scale or changing the position or even changing the context. So those changes were made and then they wanted to see if the area can classify correctly the, uh, the blah, 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 the uh, feature, the stimuli. So if it can uh, classify correctly, we can say pretty good that this uh, area can generalize over this low level, uh, over this low level feature such as scale or such as position because it doesn't matter for this area if, the, if, the, if this thing is small or large, for it it's the same thing, it can classify pretty good. If it doesn't succeed, we can say that it's not a good a generalization over this element. So what do you think? What we should we re expect to see? Where, which areas should succeed and which shouldn't? Exactly, exactly. And this is what they said expected to see that the high level area such as IT will succeed in generalization and the performance of the generalized uh, uh, classification will be very similar to those of the reference. However, when we talk about a uh, low level uh, area that are very, very sensitive to these low level changes, I, uh, they expected that they won't be able to generalize such good, such in such a, uh, a good performance and uh, uh, they will fail in the uh, classification, and this is exactly what happened. So look that V4 here really, really struggled in, a, a, in classification, and although he had 150 uh, neurons, he did uh, struggle in classification. Uh, from our presentation. Uh, 
and this is the, the fact if we take about what are the three computational goals, visual categorization. So the first thing we talked about is generalization. Yeah. So uh, the first thing we talked about is generalization. Testing those low level elements and ignore them in order to create the category. And separability, the ability to separate between two categories and of course flexibility, the ability to gain access to categorization in different levels. And the last thing, which is very important to, for me, is if we know that IT is not sensitive to low level feature, what we gain here is understanding that this insensitivity is actually what allows it probably to, uh, to uh, generalize and to separate and to actually create this, this uh, uh, categorization in it. So thank you very much. Responds the same for this picture and this picture. One new one. No, no, by definition, if you were to look at the population response, which is two for all new neurons, right? If you look at the population response, they don't tell the difference between this one and this one. That's the whole point, right? That's what he showed the graph of your face. You take all V1. Of course, you took just a sample of V1 neurons, but the idea is that you build the stimuli such that the, the response to the original image and the scrambled one.
for example, Dallas is the reverse of Pride in the week. They do they do their activities. They have to classify them into meetings. This isn't this very specific to a specific interest. Is there any indication from the inspection that these four employees are residing in that city that can assess that these are companies that could act as private citizens? So these are companies not spoken or registered. We don't know what local do it. We don't know what entity. But what 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 is important? What is interesting here is, and I think it's very very good that we are saying that these four, the representation of these four is important enough to them. more into categorical uh, object representation. Um, we did try to synchronize between us some stuff, but there will be repetitions, so I kind of decided that repetitions will be a test for you guys. 
that's a good way to do it. So, um, okay, so we're talking about the integrated temporal cortex, the new visual pathway, information flows from V1, Shaura defined it as the what we're seeing as opposed to the where we're seeing it. So what is generalization? It should be really easy. more general way of saying it is basically that we um, can uh, generalize all these pictures to, be, to say that they're all faces. General more general way to say this. Um, okay, separability. The fact that we can, um, you know, for each category we generalize it to the category, but we can also separate between different categories. We can also call separability categorization, maybe that would be a little bit easier. Um, and also, we can separate within a category, we can separate between different pictures. So we can separate between the houses, but also generalize and say that they're all houses. Invariance, he didn't use that specific term, but you see the face from different angles and it's still very nice. So this is not your lab, but uh, uh, the idea is that if you see anything that any object that you can see is going to appear from different places or even different uh, light contrast and still say that it's the same object. And the last thing that Altiar talked about is the, or maybe uh, actually Udi talked about it, is the larger set history, which we also learned with uh, Shao, basically saying that uh, as you proceed in the ventral, in the uh, vision pathway, you, the um, neuron receptive field is, uh, gets larger. So that's, yeah, that's just general now, it's a perceptual property.
maybe a general question that underlines this article and perhaps also what the you uh, presented is if this categorization is done on based on visual appearance alone or if there's some conceptual interpretation done in the empirical support. Now it's not that I'm claiming that this article answers that question, but keep it in mind as a general motivation for this uh, experiment. What is um, special with this specific uh, study is that um, what they're doing is they're matching the different re um, object representation uh, encoding that they find or activity that they find between men and monkeys. So <coughs> what they say is that there have been many studies on the imperial temple cortex in man alone and monkey alone. Um, but no real um, articles, no real studies that um, compare between the different uh, species. And also, according to them, the studies done, which also I think uh, you have studies like this, um, kind of presume categories when they check, when they uh, monitor the activity. So let's say, for example, um, subjects were presented with visual objects. The objects were categorized into faces, houses, etc., and then they checked the difference in activity. So one of the main points in this article is that they don't presume this uh, object ca category, category, and they want to see if, if uh, categorization is inherent to the uh, imperial temporal cortex. Um, regarding the cross spe species uh, comparison, so first of all, I'll, I'll show you in a minute the, um, the visual stimuli, but both monkey and human were showed the exact same object in this uh, study, and what they wanted to understand is the coding principles and not just the uh, spatial activity correspondence. So, so what they, their criticism perhaps for previous studies is that they kind of wanted to see the areas of activation in general regions, that, or not regions, but um, specific areas that react to specific uh, stimuli. And here they're actually really asking questions about the coding principles. So this is, uh, you'll see in a minute the methods they're using, but this is kind of uh, their um, motivation for choosing the methods that they chose. Okay. So diving into the experiment, um, what you see here is the uh, stimuli that were shown. It's categorized here, but as I said, uh, when presented to the subject, it wasn't categorized. This is just to so show you that they were uh, divided into animate, inanimate, like in your uh, or like you have showed the difference. Um, in the animate, there were human and non-human. So there was a lot of subcategorization, categorization, um, and the main uh, two categories were animated and inanimate uh, objects. So the way the experiment was done um, was basically using different methods for the different species. So for the monkeys, they used electrophysiology, and they were recording from single cells, extracellularly. Um, and while the monkey was performing the fixation task. And for humans, they were using fMRI to monitor the activity of the neuron. So I already see covered cases, and you should have covered cases. Um, <coughs> but, so, okay, so covered cases. <laughs> Can this, these two methods even be compared? So my point here, um, I hope that I'll be able to convince you that in a sense they can be compared. But keep in mind that this, in this specific study, the cross-species uh, question involves also a cross-spatial scale question, okay? Which means that here we're monitoring single cells, here we're looking at tens of, tens of th thousands of cell activity, and still we're trying to ask something about the similarity um, between them. So... Oh, yeah, yeah, this is just... Yo, yo, this is just, you know, drawings I found to, to, to say, but you're using the exact same model. Okay, so the last one remark before we see actual data is um, I wanted to show you that this is the vector representation we were talking about earlier. And we said we have two vectors and we can ask about the similarity between them. So what you do basically is you can correlate the two uh, vectors. You can extract the, uh, co the correlation coefficients and then build what's called an RDM, a response pattern dissimilarity matrix, which is <coughs> uh, the one of the main uh, analysis <coughs> methods that they use. And what you, what you see here is that on each side you put the, the different objects, and then you can color code from uh, the, the 
warm colors being very uh, different reactions and the cold colors um, showing very similar reactions. And obviously on the diagonal, you're going to say, OK, if I'm showing the exact same object, I expect the exact same uh, uh, reaction or activity. And then you can ask, OK, what's the, so you have the animated in animated, for example, and you can say, oh, if it's colored uh, very warmly, it means that there's a big difference in the reaction.
between, even when they were doing single cell um, uh, recording, they got d big differences between the animated and inanimate objects. It's kind of interesting to see that also here, monkeys react to faces of humans in a very <laughs> similar <laughs> way. But you do see kind of these, these um, monkey neurons. Four monkey neurons. <laughs> you do see, yeah, we didn't, we're not talking about behavior. So you do see these uh, four blocks, which basically show that within um, the anime, you also have the monkey faces and monkey faces, which is kind of similar. So it, it's an interesting uh, observation. They do say that um, it's, it's a ground for studies about do uh, monkeys think that we all look alike and then the, 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 the reaction is the same and they can differentiate more between different monkeys. So that's a whole different story. I'm just saying, throwing it out. I'll just finish. I'll just finish the idea here. Um, so even though we are looking at completely different methods, once you do the correlation within the specific method, then you can compare the RDNA matrices. This is like their idea of the data analysis. And completely different methods. This is the human and the sign, so you see that there's 
in different categories for monkey and human, not exactly the same place. So the reaction is not the international reaction, same reaction but between the, the categories, but between the objects, but in general this classification is different. Okay, so my last point, the few minutes that I have, is to talk also about um, the inferior temporal cortex role in categorization as opposed to the to um, the early individual cortex, which is very similar to what you asked said, so I feel confident to kind of skim through this. Ooh, I wanted to ask you what this matrix should look like <laughs> for the visual cortex. Kind of spoiler, okay. So the idea really is to say, you know, in the in the early visual cortex, the reaction to a man and the reaction to a banana is similar or dissimilar in a way that's not really uh, categorized. So you can't really categorize. So maybe it kind of convinces you more, even though the example was more than good, that um, even without assuming the subsort of it or whatever, just by looking at the correlation between neurons, actually it doesn't work because it's just looking at the neurons, but <laughs> in general it just says that, okay, there's no uh, categorization in early visual cortex. So the categorization, supposedly happens in the inferior temporal cortex. Okay, I have time for this. Um, this is just another way of showing what I just said, but <laughs> perhaps a bit more um, obvious. I'm just gonna talk about figure B. So what you see is um, the red is uh, between different, uh, sort of uh, difference in reaction between categories, and the green is difference in reaction which influence categories. And the bottom, you see kind of a histogram of the of the reaction. You see that in general, it's placed on the axis of dissimilarity. And the early visual cortex, cortex, it's um, presented in the same place more or less. But on the axis of IT dissimilarity between uh, categories is shifted up, meaning it's, there's more dissimilarity between categories as opposed to um, in the same category. What might be interesting here, and they do kind of talk about, but don't go into is the fact that it's a diagonal. What they're trying to say here is that within early, vi early visual cortex dissimilarity, if something was m very similar in the early, vi early visual cortex, it will also be more similar in the uh, inferior temporal cortex, and stronger maybe would be the dissimilarity. So if you have two, um, two vectors that are very not similar in the early, early visual cortex, they see that in the inferior temporal cortex it will also be less similar. So maybe this kind of hints that there is some connection between, um, you know, at least at least between how we see the different uh, the, the correlation between the vectors. Okay, so take-home messages from this specific article are supposed to be um, first of all that categorization is inherent to the IT because they did not um, presume the categories when they did the analysis, and that it's consistent across species assuming that you agree with the uh, method of uh, comparing um, uh, between species. The second thing is that categorality is absent in early visual cortex, which is uh, similar to what you asked said, and that the similarity in, in the response patterns is also uh, true for uh, different spatial scales. And this is supposed to give hope that uh, really fMRI um, is a method that can imply um, what happens in, uh, in, uh, in the moment, whatever. And the last thing, which I'm just gonna put there because I have 20 seconds, is open questions, okay? So kind of similar to what you asked before, but, but um, cross-species, cross-spatial scale, did I convince you, okay? I didn't ask what happens within a monkey in electrophysiology as opposed to fMRI. Um, obvious representation and behavior, we didn't discuss, we talked about obvious representation, but not the Categorization models, I didn't discuss, but basically they say that there aren't good uh, models for this. And vector representation averaging, which is what you said, leaving it as an open question, basically there is problem, it might be problematic that we're doing averaging over um, uh, the vectors and not actually asking what the specific thing about. Thank you.
they just um, say that they found this correlation, but it's very weak, okay? So they do show some graphs that they try to check, you know, how much really is this uh, kind of um, speed forward of dissimilarity is it really have occurring, and the correlations are very, very weak, but they do say that they think there is something here that needs to be uh, further checked. So I'm just saying that in order to, to make sure you understand that it's not real, it's not a convincing data. The second thing is that, personally, I do think that um, um, the fact that, they, that there is similarity, like uh, Yoav showed, that you can take you know, pictures and scramble them, and then V1 neurons will act in the same way, so I do think that there might be, uh, that, that, that might be the reason for the correlation, because if a specific um, neuron reacts to, I don't know, a specific orientation, let's say, and then, as opposed to a different neuron that acts in a different orientation, and then you move to a, a percept of a full object, then still those, those um, uh, what do you call it? Those uh, relations, I'm not sure, but I think they Are might. Sorry? I don't know, maybe you know. No, no, I'm not sure, but I. Okay, there's, there's a number of issues here, okay? First of all, know that this is human data, okay? So here you don't have a simple resolution to say, okay, it's interesting. Early phase of response and the later phase of response, because the later phase of response in V1, of course, is affected by feedback uh, loop coming back to V1. So, so maybe that's something you know. If you do the sort of vector representation of the early response or late response, you're going to get something different in V1. Okay. And when you do this in the fMRI, of course, you cannot uh, decipher between the two. But you're absolutely right that uh, this, is, this is an interesting uh, uh, fact uh, uh, to take. Yeah. 
that have different scale of monitoring activities. So, so. Oh, you mean the behavior in general? I want to refer to similar results. True, actually. I want to refer to behavior. You mentioned that you can bring in one of the uh, slides showing the IBM. Yeah, that's a good, that's, that, that's a, that was good. That's V1 and that's IP. Okay, so you see that there's sort of a, a cluster here for uh, maybe when you have the multi dimensional scale.
talk of uh, life, you can discuss it in the, like, a few oriented lines. And further on, you can uh, have uh, more complex uh, features like texture, illumination. And in the IP, we have a complete object view or a partial one. So what are the best here are these uh, partial, uh, partial object view? So what are the blanks? Uh,
comes out of it. Like there are just uh, random places and random, random sizes, like uh, ten, uh, above the 10,000 uh, different features, just randomly selected. And so each feature like that, they uh, ask what is the mutual information between this feature and the class that are trying to recognize. So they did it both for cars and for uh, places. So taking uh, different uh, features uh, and they give them a, a rate according to the one with the highest mutual information and the lowest. So this is an example here in A. <coughs> information about the class, and this is the second base, you see this uh, the eyes, the airline, the nose, and so on. And so just to make it clear, if you see this feature, the chances that the yes. feature that you see is a face is, is the higher. highest. Yes. Right. So if I see this <coughs> feature, um, so this is the feature that gives it me the most information. Not a specific face, a category. Yeah, a category. So you can, it's not about identification of a specific face, it's about classification. So seeing this feature, I'm probably saying that I'm looking at the face. And a white square doesn't tell me anything about the face, I think, unless I do think that the words are looking at it. And there was a question over there? Here's the feature that you would expect, maybe in V4, right? And you can, you can take each. 
not with the code specification, but also we want all uh, the login uh, files to be exactly by those pages. So let me just understand what you're saying. So basically you have built, this is the criteria to say there's a car or a face yeah. or it not in the image, right? So you sum up over F, I, K to be either zero or one, right? Mm -hmm. so the feature is detected in the image or not. Yes. And you give it a, a specific weight according to the, uh, what was uh, told before, you sum them up. If it's above a threshold, then you say, ah, it's a car. If it's below the threshold, you say, ah, it's not. changing it along